Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. I know we have a full room today, we have more people in line, and in addition to those that you see around you today, we have our podcast community. Our podcast is listened to regularly with more than 11,000 downloads. With that, I ask that you make sure your cell phones are off, and we'll be taking questions at the end of the talk, and make sure that your question ends in a question mark, um, and is topical both for us and our podcast audience. It's our incredible pleasure today to welcome Jessica Robinson Priest, who is speaking on a topic which is near and dear to my heart, which is how to elect more women, gender and candidate success in the field experiment. Here at the Women in Public Policy Program, we focus on closing gaps in the areas of economic opportunity, political participation, health and education, and are always looking for data when our favorite methodology is experimentally based data that really can provide us with tools to create replicable interventions to close these gaps. Jessica is an assistant professor of political science at Brigham Young University and co-director of the Gender and Civic Engagement Lab. She is widely, widely published um, and regularly publishes in the American Journal of Political Science, the Quarterly Journal of Political Science, Political Behavior, Legislative Studies, Quarterly Political Research Quarterly, Politics and Gender, among others. We're all very much looking forward to her talk today. And I wanted to welcome, we have two additional guests in the audience. Um, one is Ms. Kisentia Kvitka, who is a State Department Professional Fellow who hails from Ukraine. And we're very pleased that she's with us and she works with the Women's Fund of Ukraine on just these topics and issues, among others, there. And I also wanted to welcome a colleague who's visiting um, today over at the Institute of Politics, who's a city councilor uh, from Queens, Julissa Ferraris Copeland. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jessica and we'll look forward to saving our questions till the end. Thank you, I am delighted to be here. I'm really excited to be able to talk with you and looking forward to your feedback on this particular project. Um, so today I'm gonna present some research on how to elect more women, a field experiment that uh, shows some interventions that uh, that resulted in more women getting elected. Um, and I think that the first caveat is simply that most of this research is about Republican women, so, um, so I'll be curious to hear your ideas about um, whether similar things will operate for um, in the Democratic Party. Um, so if you have thoughts on that, I would uh, love to hear them when we have our conversation at the end. Okay, so we all know women are underrepresented. Um, this is, we can go through the stats, I'll skip that. Um, <laughs> this seems like an audience that already probably knows those stats pretty well. Um, so one of the questions is, can parties do anything about this? Can parties change things? Parties are institutions that already exist. They have processes and um, they're great sort of elite opportunities to, uh, to be looking for interventions. And so our question is, can parties do anything to solve the, uh, the, the representation challenge, um, perhaps short of quotas themselves. So. Okay, so as we thought about the two levers that parties might have to be able to fix this, one is to try to affect the supply of women uh, who are running for office. So we know that women are recruited less and less intensely than men. Uh, uh, a lot of Kira Samamatsu's work has been that uh, recruitment may be especially important for women, that they are less likely to be self-starters than men. Uh, and so perhaps one opportunity for political parties to change what's going on is to try to recruit more women. Right? And that's not a new or a particularly um, unexpected suggestion, but that's one that we, uh, one lever that they might have. Uh, the other is that parties may have uh, the ability to influence the demand for female representatives. Um, so we know that voters, you know, some voters hold stereotypes about male and female candidates. Uh, you know, the, the research is sort of mixed on whether this translates into actual vote choice. It might not, um, especially uh, in inter-party elections, right? But to the extent that these stereotypes are influencing demand for female candidates, they're most likely to matter among Republican women in intra-party 
contests within their own uh, within their own party. Uh, because of stereotypes about women being more liberal, this could be quite difficult for female candidates in primary elections and things like that in the Republican Party. Um, we also have a lot of political science research that suggests that elite opinion and rhetoric can then shape mass opinion and rhetoric. Uh, and especially when these elites are credible and, um, and, 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 and well-known and, and are heard, right? So, so our, our sort of second idea about something that parties can do is that when party elites set a credible norm of gender parity, there'll be an increase in women's representation. So those, as we thought about what parties can do, those were the two things that we thought might, um, might matter. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the experimental setting. Um, the, the, the sort of figure over here on the side can show you um, the Republican Party is where women's underrepresentation is the most severe. Okay, so, um, you know, in the 70s, Republicans and Democrats are both sort of like abysmally uh, representing women um, in the, you know, 10 to 15 percent range. Um, and, but in the Democratic Party, we've seen a steady climb. This is state legislators steady climb up to now uh, about a third of Democratic state legislators are women. Okay? For Republicans, the story is less encouraging. Right? It actually peaked in the 90s and has kind of been going back down a little bit. And so, so the most severe problem for women's representation is within the Republican Party. And that's that's sort of our, our, our question is how do we, you know, the Democrats seem to kind of have figured something out, right? They're marching forward. Um, the Republicans are stalled out. So what can we do to help our, our Republican friends and neighbors on this? Um, so we partnered with a Republican state party in a conservative state, a Republican dominated state um, with very low levels of women's representation. So the bottom 20%. Okay. And, um, and this, you know, this, this partner, uh, they were interested in women's representation in specifically in their uh, state nominating convention. Um, there were both sincere and strategic reasons that they were concerned about this. Um, the, 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 you know, sort of, to their credit, were, were interested in women's representation in and of itself, but also had been getting some criticism about the lack of representativeness in this caucus selection process. So in this particular state, um, they don't typically have primary elections. The way it works is uh, local precincts have caucus meetings, and they select delegates to go to the state nominating convention. At the nominating convention, they choose who's going to be the rep Republican representative um, on the ballot. And in a Republican-dominated state, Right? That person may even be unopposed. So essentially, it's this, this convention that is choosing vast, you know, like the majority of who's even in office in this state. And, um, and, and the distribution you can see here, I don't know if my pointer is not really working, but that blue line is the distribution of women's representation at the meetings, at these caucus meetings themselves. And it centers around 50 50. Okay? So most of these meetings the, 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 at the precinct level meetings, women are about equally represented as men. Uh, the red line is the, uh, the, the proportion of the delegates elected from this precinct who are women. And you can see, by far, the modal category is zero. Okay? Most of these precincts are electing zero women to go to, uh, uh, to the caucus. It's 45 percent, so not most, but many. <laughs> are electing zero women. So, so the, the party leader said, yeah, this is something that we're interested in, and, um, and so we're willing to work with you if you have ideas about this. So let me tell you what we did. So the intervention was an official letter on party letterhead from the state party chair to the precinct chairs. And this letter arrived um, a little less than a week before the caucus meeting happened itself, so about five days depending on the mail system, <laughs> how rural they were, right? Um, and in this letter, uh, there were the, uh, the precinct chairs received one of four of these letters, randomly assigned. Okay, so here is the experimental design. Um, it's an encouragement design, and in they either got a letter that was a sort of, hey, you know, make sure everyone feels welcome, and there's no real content, just sort of a placebo letter. Um, or they got a letter that uh, we're calling the supply letter, supply lever, um, 
would that encourage these precinct chairs to uh, to think about two to three women in their precinct who they think would make a good representative of their community to go to the state convention and to recruit them, to ask them to run specifically. Okay? Um, so that's the, the supply. A quarter of them got that letter. Um, the In the sort of demand, trying to have the party set norms of egalitarianism, in the, in the demand condition, uh, the letter said, here is a statement from the state party chair. Please read this paragraph at the meeting right, to all of the attendees of the meeting. And the letter said something along the lines of, hey, you know, more than half of our Republican voters are women, half of our caucus or precinct attenders are women, and yet only about 20 to 25 percent of the actual delegates that get elected are women. We think our party would be stronger. We know that our Republican women have good insights into their families and communities. We think our party will be stronger if more of them are elected. Please think about this as you're choosing who to vote for. So, um, and that was, the actual language of that was carefully negotiated with the party and they were very comfortable at the, at the end of it and, and we said now, you know, if you have people come and talk to you about this and, you know, here's some things ways to talk about it and, they, and, and the party chair finally just said if anybody has a problem with this they can just talk with me right like, this is just something that we should be doing so so that was very encouraging so the final group of, of individuals of precinct chairs got a letter that asked them to both do the recruitment and read the letter to the to the general uh, attendees okay. all right <clears throat> okay so here are the first results um, and remember, the modal category was no women elected uh, from, from the precinct. And so the very first thing that we're thinking about is what, what happened to, uh, to the precincts as far as just electing at least one woman right, from your precinct. Um, and you can see in the control condition, um, it's 37% uh, of the precincts uh, elected zero women. Or uh, no, it elected at least one woman. Sorry, getting this backwards. We flipped the scale, <laughs> actually. Um, so 37% elected at least one, one woman. It went up to 45% in uh, of the precincts elected at least one woman in our sort of double condition. Okay, so, so that's sort of the first way to think about is this precinct electing at least one woman. Um, the, the, the precincts elect between two and six individuals depending on the size of the population and how Republican the area is. So that varies a little bit across the state. Okay. All right, this is the more usual way of thinking about uh, the women's representation and this is the proportion of women. Um, in the control precincts, the proportion of women who are elected is, uh, is under 25%, it's about 24%. Um, and in the sort of supply and demand, the double treatment, uh, we got it up to 30%, so a six percentage point increase in women's representation from the control to, the, to this other treatment. And you can see the, the single treatments had some effect, not statistically significant. It really seems to be the case that having both, uh, both of the treatments is what's the most effective. All right. Um, we were concerned, we, we saw these and we were with these results and we rejoiced and, um, and we thought, uh, let's, let's double check that this is going on the way that we think it actually is going on. So we had some other data, some sort of simultaneous data collection that was going on. Um, the first is we sent to 145 of the precincts, basically <coughs> the ones that we could get to um, easily. Uh, we sent student observers, trained student observers to uh, to take notes on the happenings of the precinct. They were blind to the purposes of the study, but they had been trained about what kinds of notes to make. They had a sheet that they were filling out. Um, so the big question is, did more women run in, this, in these supply conditions? Is that, like, did that work, or is it some other mysterious thing that's happening um, <laughs> that sometimes does happen in field experiments? Uh, and so here's the data that we were able to gather in these subsample of precincts. It's not a random sample of all of the precincts. We just couldn't get to that logistically. This is supply only, or is it supply plus? This supply is demand? any of the conditions that so were supply plus supply demand. Yep, supply or supply and demand. Yep, good question. Okay, so in the in the control in the conditions that didn't have any recruitment, we didn't ask them to do any recruitment. You had about one woman running um, it, per precinct. 
for these state delegate positions. In the conditions where we at, had asked for there to be recruitment, uh, there were about one, 1.34 women running on average. So we do see some increases in the number of women running in these precincts. So that's encouraging that perhaps this is happening through the mechanism that we've wanted to, to happen through. All right, uh, the demand treatment is a little trickier to figure out how do you, how do you measure like norms and things like that. So um, after, the, after the, the experiment was over, we sent a survey to the precinct chairs. And one of the questions that we asked them was, uh, do you think uh, there should be more women at the convention? And what we saw was uh, the, the precinct chairs who were in one of the demand conditions, either demand only or supply plus demand, um, were more likely to say, yes, we do think that there should be more women at the convention. Now, whether this is social desirability or a genuine you know, interest um, is actually kind of unimportant for our purposes, right? Because they're getting the message. Either way, either sincerely or through social desirability, they're saying yes. I do believe that there should be more, just like you told us, there should be more women, um, and just like I read um, over the, you know, over the podium. Um, so, so that's our first suggestion that this is actually promoting norms of, of equality. Um, the second is that, uh, going back to this precinct observer data, um, female candidates in demand precincts were more likely to give a speech. So. Uh, so if you're nominated to run for one of these offices, usually you take you do like a one to two minute speech of, well, I've been in the community for 15 years, and I just really think that you know the federal government's out of control, and you know something like that, right? Um, so you get a couple minutes of that, and uh, what we found was in the control precincts, about 78 percent of the women who were nominated actually gave a speech, versus 90 percent of the women. In the in these in the demand precincts, so that also sort of loosely suggests that something is going on that women's voices are are being prioritized a little bit more. Question: Were those results in this one slide were statistically significant? Yes, they are marginally statistically significant. Yeah, but these are small samples, especially the observer data is small. We only had 145 precincts covered there, but they are sort of um, the the precinct chair one is statistically significant by standard measures. This one's, I think, at the point one level. So. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, so sort of the, the broad discussion here, uh, each of the treatments did increase women's representation at least a little bit, but the supply and demand together had clearly the strongest effect, and that's the only one that was statistically significant. Um, so if we extrapolate, if all of the precincts are, if all of the precincts were assigned to the control condition, we would expect to see about 920 women at this um, at this convention. Right? If all, in contrast, if all of them had been assigned, if all of the precincts had been assigned to this double uh, condition, we'd see 1,150 female delegates, which is a 200, and which which suggests that this treatment, just doing this treatment statewide would bring an additional 230 women into this formal political party process, right? So a six percentage point increase is sort of like, well, I mean, if you do get out the vote field experiments or anything like this, you say, oh, that's pretty good, right? But it sounds a little bit small. We're still not doing fantastic. Um, but when you think about 230 additional women, that's a pretty big deal. And it's especially a big deal because this, the way that this process works is that um, if you are one of these delegates, because you are the selector, you're the candidate selector for this state, um, all of the candidates will come and talk to you, they'll call you on the phone, they'll try and have lunch with you, right? And so that network, that party network, is really opened up to these additional women um, in a way that uh, that many other kinds of, and they're, not just gonna, they're just not gonna have access to otherwise. Okay, um, the mechanisms seem, uh, seem pretty well supported by the data, although of course there's always um, you know, room for more data on that. Okay, we did a replication study. Our, our kind reviewer too was concerned about um, 
uh, external validity, and that's always something that you want to think about with these kinds of field experiments. So, um, so we worked with YouGov to do a replication study. Um, I'll spend a little less time of, of, on this because it's it's a survey experiment, and it and punchline, you know, newsflash, it, it replicated. So, <laughs> um, so uh, so basically. This was a sample of validated Republican voters, um, a nationwide sample. It's a little hard to know how to make that sample, like ensure that it's a representative sample, um, but it, it was a diverse sample of validated uh, Republicans. Um, and what we did is we showed them a, a little table of potential candidates. This was a sort of full factorial design, so all of the different elements are, are randomized. Um, and we don't have the kinds of concerns about spillovers between treatments that, that sometimes plague field experiments on a survey experiment, so that was nice. Um, in the demand treatment, there was some, they read some statements from uh, the, Republic, the RNC Growth and Opportunities Report about how important it is to have more women, and also part of the statement from this party chair. Uh, and then we asked them, have you ever heard Republican officials make statements encouraging what Republicans to elect more women. Yes, I've heard them talk about it many times. Yes, I've heard them talk about it a few times. Or this is the first time. This was just to try and like hammer in. Yeah, this the, the question was really still part of the treatment, like making sure that you get the point that Republican leaders here are talking about uh, women's representation. Okay, the control group didn't see this at all. The supply treatment just saw instead of there being. Uh, uh, three men and one woman candidates, they saw three men and two women candidates. Um, and so that's, they saw, it's like as if there had been recruitment going on behind the scenes, they saw this additional woman here. Um, and here are the basic results, um, not too different than what we saw before, right? That um, the, the, the additional candidate had a little bit of an effect, um, the information from the party leader had an effect, but the biggest effect is when you have both more women running and messages from party leaders saying that this is important to vote for them. Um, so that's that's uh, that's the replication there. Okay, so parties can actually seem to rep uh, increase women's representation through active recruitment, setting norms and expectations. Sorry, in, the, <coughs> in the survey, what was the dependent variable? The dependent variable was vote choice for vote a woman. Choice. Okay. Yeah, and we did it vote increase over random. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So. You know, in the control condition, random would be 25% of the time. In, when you have five candidates, it's and two of them are women, so this is sort of increase over uh, over random. Okay, so there are parties do have levers, and quotas aren't the only option. Right? There, there are these ways that are more palatable to more conservative political parties that are encouragement designs and other kinds of things that. Um, you know, specific, when we were sitting down and talking with the with the party leaders about this, we said, "Well, what if we say? What if in the letter you say um, we think we'd love to see half of our representatives at this convention be women?" And they go, <gasps> like almost direct quote, "Oh, quotas? No, that's what the Democrats do, right?" So, so they're just they're, you have to think about what is going to culturally work for the for the the population that you're that you're considering and, and thinking about it, and there are things that Republicans are happy to talk about um, with this, but you just, you have to do it in a way that's going to be, that's going to work for them. Um, okay, so I have just a moment or two left, and so I was hoping, I thought, this is you know, a room full of very smart people, um, I want to tell you a little bit about what we're doing next with this project, so, so that particular piece um, has been accepted at AJPS, and, and you know, so... If you weren't one of the reviewers, too late, right? But um, but we have another project that we're that we're working on, and um, and it it's rooted in something that we saw in the observational data of all of these these precinct observers. Um, and what we when we started looking at the content of the speeches that the that the male and female candidates were giving, we noticed that um, that the men and women's self presentation was different. And, and this is interesting because when you look at the research on people running for Congress or running for governor, they don't find differences in self-presentation for the most part between male and female candidates. 
So, but, but we also know in the general population there are slight differences in the priorities of male and female voters. So something is going on here and we're sort of curious about what that is. So, um, so the first question is, how do men and women in these entry level elections present themselves as candidates? And <coughs> we found some data on that that showed some, some gender differences. Um, they both talk about issues, they both talk about qualifications, but they talk about slightly different issues and slightly different kinds of qualifications. Um, and does this influence who gets elected? Is the, the sort of double bind relevant? And the answer to that that we have found so far is yes and yes. So here's some interesting, the issues that men and women tend to talk about are a little bit different. Men are slightly more likely to talk about government spending or the deficit and taxes. Women are much more likely to talk about education. Um, when it comes to qualifications, uh, the men are more likely to talk about their executive and business experience or military service. The women are much more likely to talk about being a homemaker or a parent. Right? So, um, so we are seeing some of these differences here. Um, did you have any sense of whether or not the letter primed? Because the letter said women, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, have lots of information and knowledge about their families, mm -hmm. communities. I can't remember the last one. Right. So we didn't. We looked at the very the precincts that were assigned to that versus not, and we didn't see big differences there. It didn't seem to be the case that that was shifting what they were talking yeah. about. It did. I don't. It'd have, be a great experiment to do sort of a different prime and see right, what happens. Right. 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 So. Um, we did find, uh, so our sample size is small here, we did find some differences in the outcomes of, uh, in the precincts that were primed or not, um, that are a little complicated, and, and so I didn't, I don't have that slide here, but um, we do think something's going on. Right? So, so they, they have these slightly different self-presentations, um, and then we, we followed up on this with a survey experiment of 8,000 Republican caucus goers. Um, and, and there's a lot going on in these slides, but basically as you move from left to right, you're going from a more masculine self-presentation to a more feminine self-presentation. Um, we, we randomly, we, in this survey experiment, we sort of randomly assigned uh, whether the woman in the race was uh, talking about the same kinds of issues as the man or was adding things like, well, as a mother, da 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 or um, is a nurse, say, instead of a banker. Um, and the, the, the final, the furthest, uh, the furthest one here to the right is she talks, she talks about being the mo an active mother in her community and, and volunteering in her child's school and caring a lot about education. Right? Um, and what you see is as the, these female candidates get more feminine, they're becoming more likable, right? um, but they're being seen as less competent. And the, the, the gray bars are when there is no prime about gender, the, the party's not saying this is, a, you know, elect more women. Um, the yellow bars are when they read something from the party saying you should elect more women. So you can see on the competence, it's a bu the trend is the same, but there's a buffer, right? The, um, and the, the vote choice, by and large, followed the competence rankings. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so uh, the sort of the, the woman who's talking about this in terms of being a mother and volunteering in her school and caring about education gets obliterated, totally obliterated. Um, all, while the woman whose self-presentation is uh, more masculine, is, it's 50-50. It's a toss-up about who they're going to elect. And so, um, a question. Just a quick question. On the women who presented, was there a breakdown of women who work outside the home and what types of occupations they had um, versus women who um, work at home. In the, in the observational data? Yeah, because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious if there's a woman who has a more, quote, traditionally work in a male-dominated environment, right. how she's perceived versus that. Female. Right, so she's going to be, like, so we, uh, in this masculine uh, uh, category, um, experimentally, she was either the vice president of a bank or a software programmer. Mm -hmm. right? So when and, and what we found was, you know, when she presents and that when she has a masculine job, there's just no and talks about more masculine issues. There's no difference between uh, the vote choice. When she has the masculine job, but she says, "And I'm a mom," so we call this condition the super mom condition. Mm -hmm. 
Voters super love super mom. Plus mom like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, masculine plus mom. She's the super mom, and the voters love her, right? Um, but when she's a nurse or a teacher and a mom, it goes, it, the vote choice goes back down. So there is, there does seem to be some things going on there. So this is what we're working on right now. We have a, a follow-up um, on the CCES that we're waiting to get the data from that will have both Republicans and Democrats, so we'll be able to see, is this just a Republican phenomenon or what, what's going on on the Democratic side? So, um, so we think that there's a little bit of a selection effect that's going on in the process for why we see no differences of men and women in higher offices in self-presentation, that they're getting obliterated at these early, early stages, um, and has implications for both descriptive and substantive representation. Okay, that's what I have prepared. <laughs> Jessica, thank you so much for the discussion. And would you like to field your own questions? I think sure. you're going to have many. Yeah, sure. In the back. So in the survey data that you posted, uh, did you also survey for the audience's perception of male candidates when they talked about their dad and their mom? So we, we debated this actively before we fielded it. We, the initial way that we had the survey set up did have a condition where the man was talking about being a dad and, you know, and, and caring about education. We didn't think we were going to have the power. We thought we would get about 2,000 respondents. It turns out that this particular sample is like 8,000 of them responded, right? And had we known we were going to have 8,000 people, we would have done a full design. Because I do think that that's really an interesting question of, um, you know, there's this literature on the, the, the daddy boost but the mommy penalty, right? So um, what happens when the man is saying, and I'm a dad, and you know, does that help or hurt? We don't know. So we didn't do that, um, but we wish we would have now that we knew that we had the power. Good question. Um, this is great. <clears throat> it's really good. And the, the, last, the last one, as you know, goes along with tons and tons of experimental evidence and likability and confidence and all of that. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to mention in distinguishing between um, self-presentation and communication mm -hmm. at the level you're talking about mm -hmm. um, and at the higher levels, most of us who have done the research that shows no gender differences mm -hmm. in communication and campaigns. First of all, as you know, we're looking at the higher levels. Yeah. Second, we're looking at highly, highly mediated yes. where it is not really self-presentation. So all of us who did ads, that's mm -hmm. not self-presentation. That's yeah. very, I mean, you know, there's yeah. something back there, but it's very, very produced. Likewise, if anybody's using speeches at the higher level, those are written. Yes. So, so there's a really interesting thing to play with here that's not just the level, but the fact that if you can get through this, you get mediated and you wipe out, you know, the differences mm -hmm. in TV mm -hmm. ads where, mm -hmm. say, for congressional races, we really find, you know, virtually nothing right. in any way. But here you have real people speaking and using the language that they use, especially before they become professional mm -hmm. calls. Mm -hmm. so, so you have a very powerful little thing there about whether you can get up that, what happens at that right. first step before you get mediated and shaped. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so in the in the, the draft version of this paper, that's actually one of the points that we make is that <coughs> some of this, you know, if you have professional campaign managers and speech writers and stuff like that, they're, you know, they're, they're in charge of all of that. And what you want is, is a little bit secondary. I mean, the big broad principles that you care about, you can have influence over, but the actual words are going to be um, shaped by others. And so I do think that this, um, this suggests that when you're just left to your own devices and you just talk about the things that you care about and you're, you're early on, you're not trained, you don't, you're just a community member, that we see the same kinds of things that we see in the general population, which is women on average care a little bit more about issues relating to children, men care a little bit more about issues relating, relating to taxes and spending and things like that. And so it's, it's, in that sense, it's not very surprising. Right? These are just regular people, most, I mean, they're highly active regular people, but they're reflecting what we see in broader survey data. 
Um, and then there's some disconnect that happens either through selection effect or through sort of uh, handling, right? Um, and the handling is not just the text, mm -hmm. it's also, they'll have them even just to say a sentence. You yeah. go through it and through it again and again until you say it the way the way the producers want you to right. say it and you're dressed and your hair's done and everything. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's really interesting. Thank you. Um, in the back. Uh, so you were talking a lot about representation and then when you moved into this mm -hmm. idea of women jobs versus more masculine jobs, uh -huh. you mentioned nurse versus uh, bank executive. Right. But there, there could be a socioeconomic factor in there. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um, that's challenging, right? Because the pink collar jobs do tend to be lower socioeconomic status for lots of reasons, <laughs> right? Um, and so we, you know, we tried to think a little bit about how do we, how do we get at that? Um, and we were under time pressure and just didn't have a solution and went with things that are clearly triggering uh, gender. But um, if you have ideas about uh, sort of gender jobs that class and socioeconomic status are kind of constant, I would really love that because, because it would be really great. Yeah, um, but I agree, there's, there's a confounding there and I wish I, I wish I could solve that problem in the broader population. <laughs> that would be fantastic if we valued nurses and teachers a little bit more highly and maybe bank executives a little. We, had, we did say a local bank. We said vice president of a local bank, uh, a software engineer at a local company. So, but you're right. And you could say head of nursing at the local oh, hospital. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, this is really great. Um, and this is only for the future. Mm -hmm. that as you go on, if you re replicate it, in addition to masculine plus mom, you might try masculine plus nurturance. Mm -hmm. Because we know from the negotiation literature that if you negotiate for a higher salary, but at the same time say how you know dedicated you are to the company, um, that that can cut some of the negative of a woman negotiating for a higher salary. Men don't have to do that, but women have to add this extra, and I love you, part. Right. <laughs> this is for you. <laughs> Let me help you. I'm not you. negotiating for moi. <laughs> I'm negotiating for us. You know. right. um, but so, so your, spe your speech mm -hmm. that you write for people mm -hmm. could, could be masculine plus nurturance right. and see whether that gets the likability up, but doesn't get the confidence down. down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that is a fantastic idea. Thank you. Um, okay. can, I, can I ask you something about um, the timing of sending the letter out? Yes. Was it, did you say it was just a few days? It was um, about, most of them would have gotten it about five days before. And yeah. the reason for that was um, we wanted, we had a tension here. We wanted to give them enough time to actually call up some people, and these are neighborhood, these are neighbors, the neighborhood, they like they know each other, right? Um, but we also didn't want there to be enough time that they start talking to their friends, and we start getting contamination between the the treatments. And and they were doing there was a webinar training for all the precinct chairs right before we sent the letter out, and we needed to make sure that the letter didn't go out before the webinar, because the last thing we wanted to have happen was somebody say, now hey, I got this letter that was telling me, you know, what are we supposed to do with that? So it, that was the tricky yeah, thing I mean, there. I mean, the reason I asked is I'm um, thinking very seriously about running as an MP, and I've got a professor who guilt-tripping me into doing it, and uh, but it's, <laughs> it's taking, He's like, yeah, you have to do it, you know, right. otherwise all these bozos are going to come in. Right. And <laughs> it's, a, it's a kind of long process where you're thinking, oh, but I don't know enough, but no, but I don't know. Right. And you're kind of, you know, because you, you don't think that you're good enough, it's taking mm -hmm. a long time to get to the point where you think, no, actually. So if somebody phoned me up a couple of days, I would just be like, oh, I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know, so I'm just, I can, I can see why you, you know, given your explanation, why you didn't want to have that contagion effect. Yeah, so I think our best guess about what's happening here is like 60 to 70 percent of the precinct treasurers and secretaries were women. Um, 
And so our best, we have a little bit of data on this. It, it seems that that's a target population. So they sort of called up the woman who was the precinct treasurer and said, hey, this time would you think about running for, instead of for treasurer, running for a state okay. delegate? But I, you know, but it's it's true. Like if they had had more time, and if we had been able to like send multiple letters and make a bigger deal of it, I think we would have had an even bigger effect. Um, as it is, I think it's kind of impressive that like a single letter. Oh, it is. It you is. know, <laughs> but um, yeah, and we think you know with compliance, we are are we have a little bit of data. We think about half of them complied with uh, with this. So. That's our best guess about compliance. Yeah. I just want to read it to explain. Uh, is this uh, woman, woman uh, by nature is uh, caring, you know, for animals, for children, mm -hmm. and uh, for everyone. And uh, mm -hmm. so you see it by nature <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a case. Right. So is that uh, possible to teach men like that because it is naturally yeah. women are great soft for right. soft I mean very uh, kind and uh, compassionate mm -hmm. for uh, and uh, caring for the children or family for all these things but is it possible to teach men especially the very important men <laughs> to, to, to do that what we do and that's the million dollar question right um, I think uh, you know, one of the challenges in the literature on gender and politics is that we often say things like, oh, women are underrepresented, or women are talking about women's issues, or women this, women that, women, you know, and the assumption is, oh, women should sort of be more like the men. They should be more politically <coughs> ambitious. They, you know, they're under ambitious. Whereas we just rarely say, oh, maybe the men have too much political ambition, or are over ambitious, or, are over competitive or and and so I do think that we have a lot of work to do in trying to say it isn't just the case that the men's way of doing it is the right way and we need to make them women just more like the men right and 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 think a little bit more about how do we think what it, what makes for the best leadership <coughs> and trying to train and design institutions to choose based on good leadership qualities be they masculine or feminine characteristics, right? And and um, it's not my area of expertise to, to know like how you do that, but I think that's an important question. So this was wonderfully stimulating and oh, brought good. up lots Thank of uh, other ideas. And so two thoughts I was having. Uh -huh. One is that um, it, it behind the scenes maybe uh -huh. is this whole question of default judgments that we make about men and women and others. And so uh, I was thinking that it might be interesting if you took those speeches mm -hmm. that have content that we can uh, traditionally as masculine or feminine, mm -hmm. but if you actually ask raters to look at them mm -hmm. uh, with no sound play, you know, yeah. what do we actually see in terms of how people are presenting themselves and their likability and competence that's conveyed through gesture yeah. rather than just word? Yeah. And then with respect to the letter that you sent, it occurs to me that maybe one of the mechanisms of action is that it actually um, disrupted the default by obliging people to at least think for a few minutes. And by virtue of using that kind mm -hmm. of just intentionality, produced more action. Yeah, I think absolutely part of what made that an effective, the letter effective, was that it was surprising. Mm -hmm. um, and this is why I'm, I don't know if the, if it would work the same way for the Democratic Party, because it's already sort of, there's lots of language about women's representation, and that's a, a sort of ideological priority for the Democratic Party. So I, I don't know, we'll find out on the CCES uh, uh, study. Um, I, I think that's element of surprise. <laughs> oh dear. Um, <laughs> the, the surprise, I think, is, is part of what made it really powerful. It was a little bit disruptive, and wait, you know, the party chair is saying this. Um, back here on the blue and white striped sweater. Oh, yeah. Um, on that note, then one of the one of the things you could do in the letter for a Democratic candidate, rather than using that element of surprise and increasing mm -hmm. that kind of salience, is using the 
kind of other behavioral techniques that are used often in letters of saying like, you know, your Nate, your precinct next door nominated yeah, this many men, sort of this many women. Norms, or like nine out of the shame. ten precincts nominated this many women. <laughs> yeah. So that kind of social, yeah, social pressure. Might, might yeah, that's a good idea. Thank you. good question. Um, it varies by precinct. So it's it's a very, um, we sent all these students out and one of the things they came back and they said was, gosh, we thought it would be way more organized. And <laughs> it really was, you know, I mean, it's just a bunch of neighborhood people sitting down trying to figure out, and they've got these instructions from the party and you know, like I, when I went to one of these a couple years ago, um, they were like switching the electoral rules between each different election for just, well, hey, we've got five candidates, so let's just choose the top three. And I'm like, single non transferable vote? Like, <laughs> what are you doing here? You know? So, um, so I think it varies by precinct. And that's a really interesting question of what, what, what kind of response are they getting? Um, we did tell the coders to write down if there was anything like surprising or weird or interesting or <coughs> something that stuck out. So it would be interesting to go back and see if any of them mentioned like there were there was hostility or something like yeah, that. Well, I, I mean, two of some similar work with people who've been appointed to federal agencies, and in their appointment hearings, the questions that women are asked are different than the yeah. questions that men are asked. So I was, you know, women are asked how they're going to be able to manage this huge agency and what kind of yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that would be very interesting. I'll go back and look at that. Don't have to do that. Because of the the letter, they might just be they would have not run otherwise. So it's yeah. interesting. What are their qualifications? Yeah. How do they compare? Let's look at that. Let's look at that. I don't know if this is um, for future treatment, but I'm an elected official, right, right. in Queens. Um, first woman had to push back a lot of negative um, mm -hmm. positions. Um, how many of those women that ran actually won? Yeah. Right. And then after they won, what were the positions or chairmanships or subcommittees mm -hmm. that they received, right? Because it's not only just getting and winning. Well, first it's like just getting over the hump of winning. Yeah. And then once you're there, then you're assigned to women's issues, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about you getting to the table, then what happens once you're at the table? <laughs> and they're like, oh, we're not going to feed you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, go get your own meal, right? <laughs> 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 your own. Yeah, I, I think that that is really the next sort of next frontier. We, we focus a lot on descriptive representation in political science because it's easy to look at the numbers, right? And did we do better? Did we elect more women? Is this a good election? Is this a bad election? Um, but power is about much more than just getting elected or just running. Right, or it's, it's just influence, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. it, then, but I think you could measure budgets, like where's money going? Mm -hmm. You know, do we get the free feminine hygiene products or not? Right, right. Like it's right. not easy to guide. It's yeah, kind of it, so. yeah. And, and, and I think I've got another project with um, uh, one of these colleagues and, and another colleague that is looking at the composition, so uh, sort of the composition, the gender composition of a group and how that changes the dynamics. And there's been some, you know, he's done research on the fact when there's sort of just a lone woman, then it, it, she just isn't listened to, right? There's, this is Chris Karpowitz and Tali Mendelberg's work. Um, and what we're looking at is what happens in natural group settings over time, right? 
because you know most of the time you, when you're on a city council like you work together over the course of years so do some of these negative things that are happening early on do they sort of ameliorate or they get exacerbated and um, so we're, we're in the middle of data collection for that but what we're finding is not that encouraging, right? It's <laughs> I can tell you that. Now. Yeah, <laughs> right, 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 exactly. Is that, that, that those patterns kind of stick around. Although it seems to be the case that the women feel better at the end of mm -hmm. the process. They feel like they're being more heard. We're not sure they're actually being heard. Yeah. Uh, one of the things which really identifies with the last two comments is I think when the letter came out, one of the effects that you see is pent up demand mm -hmm. and pent up supply. So you had mm -hmm. some women who always wanted to, but really understood the dynamics within their party system, and this was an opening. Yeah. And you had some people who thought of women consistently, but mm -hmm. didn't make the ask because right. it wasn't socially acceptable and normed right. within that party. Right. And I'd be very yeah. interested to see what happens over time. Yes. Um, and because the letter went five days prior and after the webinar, mm -hmm. my expectation was there likely wasn't time for people to be affronted and offended and organize against it. And I think mm -hmm. we would see backlash effect yeah. um, that after could, some amount of time as well. That could be. We, the party heard from two precinct chairs out of the 2,000. They heard from two precinct chairs. And I think it was in part because it was a suggestion. They were very careful about the language. Right. Right? If you would be so kind to do this, we'd appreciate it kind of thing. But I agree that if this was a more sort of public, systematic, like people had the time to talk more about it, it might, you might see. Well, what um, I'm really thinking of is who lost. Yeah. Which men went expecting to be elected and weren't? Yeah. And how would that play out in the future? Right. If you have 230 an men who are like, hey, I've always had the seat, or I've, you know. So, one of the things that we're, the project that's on the table, right, is, is we wanted to see if this spilled over to, we now have another precinct caucus, uh, you know, but another year of this, right? Mm -hmm. So, it happens every two years. Um, and so we were interested to see if there is sort of long-term effects of this. So the precincts that had been assigned to these conditions in uh, was it 2012, what happened in 2014? 2014, 2014 and 2016, sorry, <laughs> this mixed up. Um, and so are there, is, if we change long-term the culture, that would be like shocking if the single letter kind of, but we think it might, if it does happen, it might happen through incumbency, right? right? So, so now you have these additional women who are the, they've done it now, right? They are the state legis or the state delegate, and, um, and so maybe through incumbency, there's some long-term lag on that. But I, I think you're right, I think there's pent up demand and supply, and you know, if you just had asked me 10 years ago, I would have done it 10 years ago, but, now I finally have permission, mm -hmm. uh, social permission to, to do it. So I think that's probably a likely mechanism. Are there any similar studies about democratic precincts or voters? <laughs> and yes, how does the results compare and what uh, Right. So so nobody's done that yet. I mean, this is kind of this is the first like field experiment on this kind of uh, level. Um, and I would absolutely love to be able to do something similar with Democrats. So if any of you have connections <laughs> or are willing to work with me on this, I, I think I, I would love to see that. We're going to have, I mean, um, uh, I have some data on Democrats and some survey experiments and things like that, and there does seem to be some differences. We'll have more on the CCES once we get that, because that's nationally representative, but um, did you have? Yeah, I just, um, thank you, this is amazing. Um, I got a couple maybe just factual clarification things. Um, the first was about um, the number of candidates that the Free State could send. Like, I know you're originally a comparativist, and yes. like, isn't there something about like mm -hmm. district magnitude type idea here? And when you have more seats, um, do, you, do you see sort of a, an increased size or effect? And then the second one was on the slides on likability and competence. I think I know the answer, but is there a gender? By the 
individual, like the respondents. So, yes, exactly. so we have not the, to the answer to your second question, we just haven't gotten to that part of the analysis yet, but um, I think it'll be really interesting to see if there are gaps between the men and the women in how they're rating these particular candidates. I just don't have that yet. But um, yeah, district magnitude should matter, right? So my training is in comparative institutions, <laughs> and, um, and, and district magnitude should it should matter, and I just haven't looked at that yet. I was just talking with Archon Fung, and, and we kind of got to the same place. And I can't believe I haven't thought to look at this yet. We did do subgroup analysis. It seems to be the case that um, the precincts that had male precinct chairs, it, that's where the movement was happening. And the, and, but, but this is hard because there are all sorts of reasons to believe that precincts that are electing female precinct chairs are just fundamentally different than mm -hmm. precincts that are electing male chairs. So, um, so I don't know what to make of that exactly, but it, the movement is mostly happening in precincts headed by male chairs. So, for whatever that's worth. Well, thank you for the presentation. That was great. So, I imagine that one of the most crucial moments in the project was to convince party leader, no? because yeah. it's, a, it's not only an academic study, it's an experiment with implication. No? Mm -hmm. So how it was this process of convincing the political <laughs> leaders? It was just one person, it was a team. Yeah, so there are three of us on this project. Um, uh, one of my co-authors has some long-standing connections with, with the party um, and has lots of credibility. He's done some polling work for them and things like that. And um, so I think that helped um, the other thing that helped, I mean, the field of experiments, right, it's op very opportunistic, right? And one of the things that helped us was uh, there a, was a big debate going on about whether the state party should stick with the caucus convention nominating process or should move to primary elections. And so they were getting, the, the party wanted to, wants to stay with caucuses and conventions. Um, but there was a big public campaign um, to switch to primary elections, and the, one of the arguments was it's not a representative. But you have you know these ex sort of ex extremists. It's all men who are making these choices, and so the party was looking for all sorts of reasons to be able to say, oh, we're, but we're working on that, you know, like uh, so. It was a fortuitous opportunity. But once we once we got in the door, they were actually very happy to be working with us, right? It was, it was not a, it was not arm twisting, right? So really the, uh, the, the only real question was what is the, what are the, what is the content of the letter actually going to be? Because they had some ideas about things that were going to work better for Republicans and things that they just objected to. And so we, we was fortunate, um, you know, it was connections. And, uh, and so that's why I say, if any of you have connections or <laughs> willing to work with me as a field experimenter, I thrive on, on that. So, yeah, that was it. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, one thing, and I don't know if you've looked into this in the past, um, going on previous question of the male party leads being the ones that like, actually mm -hmm. get more women nominated. Mm -hmm. um, are you planning on looking into whether or not the idea of having a male sponsor mm -hmm. is more uh, effective in promoting women, and if there's a difference um, in having a male sponsor between the Republican and Democratic Party? I think that's an excellent question. Um, like I said, the, the, the data that we have is observational at that point yeah. and hard to know exactly what's going on. I suspect back to this question of sort of disruption and surprise and credibility mm -hmm. to having, I, you know, I think there are advantages to having men saying, hey, we need more women, right? In a way that women saying, you need more of us is like yeah. not maybe as effective. Yeah. But I think that's an excellent question and I would love to do some research on that. And if there are partisan differences, that would be very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Because it would go to the credibility of men and women both of those parties. And it, there could not be, which yeah. could also be interesting. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's not, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I know you said the modal response was that there was no representation. Uh -huh. Did you control at all for uh, precincts that had had 
women in Prior. positions before, so not in leadership, but had seen women in that position before. Yes, so we also, um, I think I, in one of the appendices in the paper, um, we have a control for prior, uh, so sort of, so the analysis is then sort of like improvement from the last year, right? Mm -hmm. And we see the same okay. results, yep. So it's, it does seem to be the case that, that, that regardless, this was actually, um, the, the, the great thing about this project was every time we would throw like a wrinkle at it, like, well, what if we, what if we do a different dependent variable? It still worked. What if we do a Bonferroni correction? It still worked, right? Like, so that it's, it's been beautiful in that particular way. But we did we did check for that. So the the change also had the similar pattern. Yeah, thanks for that. It was great. Do you have any ideas about kind of follow up things you could do to either reinforce this effect or to kind of build on it? Yeah, we would love to do another round. We talked about potentially trying to make it happen again for the second, for the following caucus meeting. And um, all of us were just kind of too busy <laughs> to, to really do it. And there were some other dynamics going on in the party that made it more difficult. But I would love to, I mean, the thing that I'm the most excited about is to look at the election returns for this last caucus meeting and see if there is any lag, if, if yeah. we have a sort of long-term effect, because that that would be fantastic. And I don't, I personally am skeptical that it's like a big change of norms in that precinct. I think it probably would just be incumbency, but um, but I'm really excited to look at that data. And I, but yeah, I would love it if they would just implement this statewide and just permanently <laughs> do it. I, Unfortunately, I don't get to tell them to do that, but yeah, I wish. Um, one thing uh, that this kind of brings to mind for me is wondering why, so if it is like so easy to increase, because that's like a pretty large percentage point increase if you're preparing it to get out the vote or things like that. Um, like, why has this leveled off among Republicans or even declined yeah. over the last, it looks like, 20 to 30 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. compared to the Democratic Party? And I wonder if uh, when people do talk about these initiatives in real, like, outside of this field experiment, if they talk about it in a partisan way that, that actually turns Republicans off to it, right? So, like, like we don't want to be like those Democrats right. who are emphasizing this sort of thing. and so. I wonder how you think about that in terms of generalizing your findings. Right. Yeah, so um, I think that's a really important question. I think part of the reason the leveling off has happened, or our results may suggest, is that the rhetoric in the Republican Party over the last 30 years has been anti-feminist, right? That's just been sort of the norm that they've set is that we don't, like, we're you know, we're, we're not the Democrats. We're not, you know, there's sort of this like conflict extension happening on the issue of gender representation. And, um, and so, you know, I did not, my graduate training was not in experiments. I've come to them later and, um, and, but nothing has made me more appreciative of like high quality, qualitative work, historical work, cultural, anthropological, anthropological kind of work than running field experiments. Because what you realize very quickly is that you, you have one shot, right? You, you have one intervention and it has to be adapted to that population, it has to be adapted to that particular question and you darn well better like be working with the people who understand that group. And so I think the questions of external validity and sort of generalizability are, are really good. And I would say, I, I don't think, I, I would be skeptical that this exact experiment would work in another setting because I just think that that's not how like real good convincing rhetoric works. Like rhetoric works when it's targeted to the audience that it's pointed towards. And so I do think that you kind of, in some sense, have to think, all right, we have these broad sort of theoretical principles. Our survey experiment suggests that it does seem to work more broadly among Republicans. But the exact message is going to have to be tailored place by place. 
And I think it's not helpful you know, to have this become, you know, if, if the Democrats say there's only one way to talk about this, right? So we got some criticism because the message was, oh, Republican women have insights into their families and communities. And that's highly gendered language. It's, it's sort of in a box with a fox kind of, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's really kind of narrow language. And, um, and my response is that's what, that's what they feel, you know, like, that's the contribution that they see as being important. Um, and so if you want more women to get elected you in the Republican Party, you have to play on the Republican Party terms, right? You, you have to kind of work with that. So, so yeah, the, the answer is I do think that there are problems with generalizability, but I think that's just like the nature of the beast. Okay. Can I just Thank do a foot, footnote on that for um, folks in the room because we have about half, more than half non-American right. mm -hmm. folks here, uh, that the polarization that's uh, increased dramatically in the United States since 1980 and is now greater than it's been in 100 years, drop, will be driving those attitudes yeah. toward women because, precisely because of the point that you, may, you made that, that um, things that are pro-women are now seen as democratic. Mm -hmm. So Republicans will stay away from them for that reason, for partisan um, reasons, because yeah. they are branded as democratic now. Right. right. This is my great one of my great fears about this election is that something like sexual assault now gets sort of partisan polarized, or you know, I mean, there are just these concerns. As soon as one party touches it, the other party is going to it's going to just like hear and then. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, thank you. I'm a second year MPP student. Great. Really enjoyed hearing it, um, but I would be so interested if you tried to replicate it in the South with the Democratic Party, because I think that that is kind of where you see a lot of these cultural issues mm -hmm. around gender norms come into play. I went to undergrad in Virginia, and uh -huh. I feel like this is definitely a thing there, uh -huh. and that would be a really interesting external validity. Question. I would love to do that. Yeah. yeah, that is a great idea. Yes, thank you You're very welcome. much. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, I'm also interested in, in issues of transferring transferability but to different settings like in a university for women going out for tenure right. or in companies women going out for higher positions and that kind of stuff and I don't know whether there's some studies on that. Um, let me say two other settings. Um, I don't know I mean I haven't I don't think I've looked at that enough to to say if they've already done field experiments on this and other Settings. Maybe anybody in this room know of some? You guys are probably actually managerial, managerial promotions. Yeah, yeah. Board. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I, but I think that would be a really interesting question of how far can we say, you know, I saw this, uh, I saw something recently um, that I think it was the Harvard Business Review put out a thing about if you only have one woman on your short list, it's mm -hmm. like it's statistically impossible for her to get elected. Right, so the supply of just like having women to choose from sets itself sets a norm of this is the kind of thing that women do. Like when you have multiple women applying for the job and on the short list. So I do think that that's, that's an important question. And I just wanted to kind of add that I, the area that I represent is 138 languages spoken, right? So then you also have the newly naturalized voter, mm -hmm. and they come with their experiences yes. from whatever country they yes. represent, mm -hmm. right? And the person who has lived here their entire life. Mm -hmm. And the way you speak to those voters is very different, and also what I represent to those voters is very mm -hmm. different. Um, you know, for a group, I was the first and historic, yeah. and for another group, it's like, oh my God, my person will never be elected again, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it would be interesting how, when you have all these cultural diversities and all these other layers um, presenting it's almost like you have to be a chameleon as right. a woman mm -hmm. to not offend one and then be cool with the other one and yeah. and I don't think men at least the men that were in my race had to do that it yeah. was just like oh you're a man thank you for running right. 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 right and then you're a woman why are you running yeah mm -hmm. right yeah I think those questions especially of intersectionality of gender and culture uh, race and ethnicity, I think those are really important questions, and I, um, 
we've got like survey experimental data sitting on the Dropbox <laughs> waiting to analyze um, for a different project, but I, I do think that that's a really important question of what happens, um, so this is like a predominantly white conservative group right. here, right? So the, the, the dynamics are like as straightforward as you can get when you're talking about issues of gender. Um, and less of America. Yes. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. 20 years from now, there'll be right. less of that demographic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why it's really important to like transfer, I would love to find out if something similar to this worked for people of color, right? To get more people of color in office. I don't know because I think the dynamics are a little bit different. And so, you know, like I said, every field experiment, you gotta kind of start from scratch and think like, what are the interventions that are gonna work here? Um, how important is recruitment? How important are norms and things like that? Um, but I, I think that there's lots of possibility for trying to use this model to answer other questions. Are you going to be looking at age? Because I'm sure you can pull it out of the photo file. Age, that's a good question. Because I think that will, partic particularly as you use this information, perhaps over time in some way, to make some predictive suggestions, mm -hmm. age and how we see that shift. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great suggestion. And, and you have access to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. So the early slide you did where you looked over time uh -huh. at the representation among Democrats and Republicans, if you push that graph way, way back to the beginning of the 20th century and look across the country at um, women occupying state party positions, mm -hmm. especially, um, earlier in the 20th century, the Republican Party did somewhat better than the Democratic yes. Party. Yes. And, and when we, we used to look at that and say, wait, that doesn't go with the ideology, what is that? that that's, it's really from a time when the Democratic Party was a coalition party. The Republican Party simply wasn't. So that in a coalition party where you have to worry about this ethnic group and that ethnic group and the unions and this one and that, the <coughs> women get squeezed out, whereas mm -hmm. if it's not a coalition. Anybody who's okay with the ideology is... And you if know. you've served your time. Now women may have to serve a little more time, but if you've served your time, mm -hmm. you're okay. And so I'm really fascinated by the timing in which you see the Republicans flattening out because they're a well, before last week, a coalition party. <laughs> <laughs> party. Yeah. But it's it's a coalition party, and yeah. again, so you have, you know, the Tea Party and the Main Line and the, mm -hmm. the former Southern Other Democrats, Democrats and yeah. the, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's you know, you going wonder, especially if you raise the question of you know, women and gender, going back to what a few people were saying, of people going, oh God, that's a democratic thing, yeah. that it's become politicized, right? And in the early Republican Party, uh, class was a, a consideration, and right. class get cut across genders. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's an interesting this particular state, which we're being cagey about, but um, that's probably not too hard to <laughs> figure out. Um, women's representation was actually so the first woman ever elected to the state senate was from the state, right? And so uh, early adoption of uh, women's suffrage, active participation in the women's suffrage movement, um, on the radical side of the women's suffrage movement, and and so it is an interesting thing. It's interesting how these things change over time based on political considerations. Yeah. So I, I wanted to say first of all, I think this is absolutely brilliant because it's yeah. a, a, you know it's an intervention that works in a in a setting that most of us probably wouldn't have thought of. Mm -hmm. And the skill with which you crafted it was like beyond, you know, just Thank incredible. You. Thank incredible. you. Thank you. So, you know, <laughs> Opportunities report, right? I mean, some of the language on the survey experiment was lifted straight from the RNC's report. We've backtracked since 2012, but yeah. So I just wanted to say, I hope you consider this a pilot, right? <laughs> <laughs> I would love to do it a million times, yes. Because <laughs> we want it. Thank know? you. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
I think that's a particularly lovely comment for us to end on. Do you, do you have a couple moments that people want to oh, share absolutely. a thought or ask I, you a yes, question? Yes, of course. <laughs> I've got nothing to do, but. So again, Jessica Robinson-Priest, thank you so much for joining us.